So why do we need a European Open Science Cloud? That's the focus of our next session. And our first speaker is Katrin Amunds, Professor for Brain Research at the University of Dusseldorf and Director of the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine, Jülich, and the Scientific Research Director of the Human Brain Project. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm representing here the European Human Brain Project and uh, our mission is to explore the multi-level complexity of the human brain. That means to understand uh, how single molecules work but also how cells are being connected and what does it mean if you are, for instance, doing a spatial search for a certain book or if you want to read the book so to understand the neuronal mechanisms. But this is not enough for us. We want to go further. We want to go translate this knowledge uh, to medicine uh, and to technology. And in order to doing it, uh, we need a European uh, research infrastructure. Why a European research infrastructure to understand the brain? So let it uh, explain it to you. So the Human Brain Project uh, is a European flagship project which was started in 2013 and uh, it consists six different research platforms. Uh, one of the research platform is a so-called uh, medical informatics platform. Here we want to acquire and analyze knowledge uh, from uh, or data from patients. Neuroinformatics helps us to understand how things are together. Brain simulation help us to uh, use models and simulate then the brain. Um, we would like to learn from this uh, brain knowledge for building new robots and uh, also developing new neuromorphic devices, neuro-inspired computing. And last but not least, uh, we would like to unlock the power of supercomputing for neuroscience um, and bringing the neuroscience community uh, to supercomputing. So to do this, we would like to integrate not only different internal effort, but also uh, be open and uh, include external efforts, data, and collaborate. So we would like to build the basis uh, for a collaborative brain science, uh, not only in Europe, but also going further beyond. And uh, we invite uh, the research communities, but also partners from industry, from education, and from university to be part of this uh, initiative. What does it mean in terms of data science? And this is a very simplified view of how we are organizing our data, and it is already very difficult and very complex. But still, I mean, we have data coming from different types of experiments in the lab, uh, we have model data and we have different uh, simulation data and uh, we have uh, established workflows and uh, a system to curate this data uh, to uh, introduce certain metadata on different levels of detailedness and this allows us to search the data and to find the data uh, through uh, a tool that we call the knowledge graph which is a, a meta database and since the brain is organized in a topographical way, so it's important whether you are here in the brain or there in the brain, we are introducing an atlas which includes all these different types of data. And our major principles are to share this data, not only within the project, but outside also, to find the data, uh, but also to use the data, that is to, to analyze the data. So this is the idea how our neuroinformatics platform is contributing. And then, we have uh, in the Human Brain Project uh, simulations which try to describe by mathematical models certain aspects of brain organization. And this is just one example coming from a simulation of the hippocampus. This is a small region in the brain which is responsible for, uh, for learning and for memory, and it is very important in Alzheimer's disease. So we would like to understand how this uh, region is working. But unfortunately, we need a lot of compute tower power, five hours uh, just for one second of simulation of this little tiny piece of the human brain. 
There's another type of application, or I would call it rather use case, because we're learning from these use cases a lot, not only about the brain, but also about the technology that we need. This is coming from our analysis of networks, and Victor Josa said that networks are so important to understand epilepsy. So here we are zooming into, uh, again, the details of the network of the hippocampus, and what you see are the different uh, fibrous axons of nerve cells connecting the different parts of the brain. And we have a completely different situation. This is just one brain, but if you analyze this with such spatial resolution, we end up with three or four petabytes. So this is, of course, a challenge that we have to address um, together and where we need really large resources. And this is where Phoenix is coming in, our research infrastructure, which is relying on five prey centers in Europe, in Barcelona, uh, in, in Paris, uh, at Chinica, in Lugano, and at Forschungszentrum Jülich. And the goal here is to provide further services for federated data infrastructure, which is tightly coupled to supercomputer for HPP, but also for other scientific communities. So here we have the link also of the science uh, community coming from brain science to other communities like, for instance, climate research or particle physics. And uh, it is uh, funded through a cold, uh, project called ICEI. So the HPP is building a brain-related infrastructure. Brain research is already an interdisciplinary uh, endeavor, and we are developing this integrated platform in order to have the possibility that all these different disciplines can collaborate, can share, and uh, create a synergy uh, which is beyond uh, single initiatives. Phoenix provides a European network for data exchange, allowing to handle big data, but also very uh, compute-intensive workflow. And based on this infrastructure, uh, but also on our um, approach that we are using fair data, that we are sharing data, exchanging them with other brain initiatives, for instance, we think that this represents a link for embedding uh, our uh, project also into the EOS Federation of Data. FAIR and uh, FAIR data, which are really, so to say, executed uh, to the last detail, and, and this means really how do we curate the data, how we make them accessible, how we process the data, and, and all these tricky questions uh, which, are, which have to be addressed. Uh, I mean, we are trying this to do in the HPP, and we have developed a knowledge graph in order to support uh, this process. So we think that HPP can contribute services to EOSC and also benefit from this uh, collaboration through a true win-win situation. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks indeed. I'd now like to invite Wen Hua Li, the Chief Scientific Officer and Deputy CEO of the Age Against the Action Against Age-Related Macular Degeneration and Director of the Affordable Medicines Program at the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford, which happens to be my own alma mater. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for spending time here this morning with us. Um, I would like to just walk you through why we think uh, we need the EOSC. The demand for novel and affordable medicine is ever increasing, especially now for our aging and expanding population. However, we all know that drug discovery is very expensive, very slow, and has, has very high rates of failure. But then you can ask me, would open science work in such a competitive uh, area of science? And I can say, yes, it does. And I would like to share with you an example with the Structured Genomics Consortium, what I used to work for the last 14 years, uh, together with the IMI project, UltraDD. There, our colleagues have actually practiced open science by making all the data, results, and even material, like new lead compounds, starting points for new drugs, completely open in the public domain. What has that has enabled is tens of thousands of other scientists who then work together in industry and in academia in a crowdsourcing mode. And that has already advanced tens of novel experimental drugs for different conditions. And that's the beauty of the open science. We can never plan the route. We seed the tools out there so broader community can start exploring it. 
Now, let me give an example of the dimension of that impact. So one of the SGC's open project alone has enabled in just the last five years uh, more than 40, 40 clinical trials for many different diseases. And that, together, means more than one billion euro, uh, more than one billion euros of the investment, mostly from private initiatives, all built on open, rely, openly available uh, assets. This also actually creates new business model because we removed constraints of how different knowledge can be exploited. So two examples, one, it's called M4K Pharma, which was founded to do everything from the discovery all the way to clinic and into patients completely in the open science. But that's being done for an area where you have a market failure. In this case, a ultra rare, a very rare brain tumor, pediatric brain tumor, children's brain tumor. Another one, the SGC also worked on a very rare disease called the fibro dysplasia ossificans progressiva or stone man syndrome, where muscles slowly turn into bone and they are frozen in a condition that is very, very uncomfortable. From an ultra-rare disease, one in two million, to we know this disease, to designing a clinical trial, it took the SGC no more than six years. Why? Because we could source the efforts and multiple minds of the crowd. And with the focus being driven by families of the patients and the patient themselves, and a small amount of funding. All of this is done with no more than 300 scientists, but through the power of open, we were enabled to work with tens of thousands. So this is impact of one single open science initiative, interestingly funded public and privately, but with limited funding. Now I ask you, can you imagine the impact that the EOSC will have by really implementing a continental approach to open science? I can. I think that the impact will be felt far beyond the established stakeholders, presently mostly as academics and industry colleagues, because the efficiency will increase. But these will spill well into society, because as efficiency increases, we will have, as a consequence, more, better, cheaper, faster medicines to the community, to the society. But this is not effort only for the society, but with the society, and we can enable this to be done by the society. Why? Because I believe EOSC will really enable a new breed, if you like, of what I would like to call the first degree stakeholders, those who experience the personal challenge on a daily basis and would like to take action and not wait for some other stakeholders to do it. Uh, I have to say, this actually means that the patients have now become more and more impatient and are active players uh, in a hopefully society-led innovation grounded on transparency and trust. So the participation will be vital for bridging the gap of many hidden burdens. And that's why I joined the Action Against AMD, because it's a non-profit civil organization where we try to bring the open science outside the realms of the traditional stakeholders, aiming at tackling this condition, which is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. Uh, estimated to be 15 million people in Europe affected by the early forms of disease for which there's no way to stop, yes? And that's a number generated by FP7, iRISC, and E3 consortium. So, and interestingly, this organization I work for now is not funded by just the usual funded charities. There are two other charities. There are Armed Forces Blind Veterans. They're also interested in helping, driving the science. So we're seeing this expansion uh, of stakeholders who can actually help. So for me, finalizing, EOSC is way more, much more than just simply connecting silo data, enabling scientists. To me, this is a real landmark in the history of science because then we enable the creation of a more equitable and participatory ecosystem uh, for the establishment of a scientifically cognizant society which has been, is being launched today in Europe, so we can all work together for a better place. Thank you. And now we have a testimonial from Hanifa Khayeri of the Swedish Research Council and also EIRG National Delegate. Uh, 
Thank you for the nice introduction. And I want to start by thanking the organizers and the Austrian presidency for inviting me and allowing me uh, to say a few words here, especially in this lovely venue. I always wanted to make some noise in the library. Uh, the Swedish Research Council is the largest funding body of public and basic research in Sweden. And we also have the overarching responsibility for research infrastructures. Now for us, science is the pinnacle of human society. Scientific discoveries, they drive and push the boundaries of what humanity can understand and achieve with its surrounding universe. And with the advancement in science, research methodologies have become more complex and they rely on more advanced technologies and combination of technologies. Sometimes these technologies make out our research infrastructures. In Sweden, for example, uh, we have built the Max4 synchrotron facility and are together with other European countries building the ESS, European Spallation Source. And these two are examples of research infrastructures that would produce large amounts of data. Now, this makes, we end up in this data producing world then where data becomes a very expensive resource, not very different from a natural resource. So by harnessing this resource, we can continue pushing the scientific limits. But producing high quality data is costly and it requires investments in, for example, education, research, and as we said, research infrastructures. So a research data life cycle where the data can be reused many times and combined in many different ways is simply cost effective. It can also be argued that publicly funded research should be made open in order to enable highest degree of reuse. And in this context, the FAIR principles that embody EOSC are really key principles for opening up research data. But research data and open science can only have a large impact if it's done collectively and not on an individual basis. Uh, some scientific disciplines that we've seen examples of today uh, have shown us how we can actually benefit by opening up our research data and sharing. Uh, for us, EOS could be a way to change uh, research culture policy and align our policies together. It could be a way to develop common standards and terminology and also tackle the challenges with interoperability that prevent us from sharing scientific information. It's also important that EOSC is built and governed in such a way that it motivates researchers to open their data and reuse others' data. And as other people have said today, we shouldn't forget that it's also our collective responsibility to maintain research quality, cost sharing, research integrity, and the trust in science. But it's funny because it's almost impossible to say when we've actually reached the goals and the vision of EOSC because production of science is a continuous thing. So fostering and promoting an open science culture has to be a continuous thing as well. But EOSC is very important because it marks a common goal and a willingness to work harder together for an open research society and to ensure wider use of this high quality research and enable more excellent research that keep pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and achievement. So from the Swedish Research Council, we are very excited about the launch today and looking forward to this endeavor together. Thank you. And to conclude our testimonials, here is Ruth Vodak, Distinguished Professor and Chair in Discourse Studies at Lancaster University in the University of Vienna. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful also to Paolo Budroni, who hasn't been thanked yet, but I think the organization is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm also very happy to meet 
uh, and see many friends here and people who I've worked together with. I seem to be the only person, professor, researcher, apart from our vice rector and our minister who works at the University of Vienna. And I can remember the time when I spent many days and also parts of my night in this library. Uh, you know, in many ways, I'm a, a bit different than my previous speakers as I come from the humanities and social sciences. So I will not be able to show you fantastic slides with brains and networks. We work with very different data. And I will say a bit about that in a minute. But just to recapitulate uh, my own life uh, and some decades of my life, I started out here at the Universitätsbibliothek many years ago. And at that time, not only did we write by hand, um, and I don't know if you can still remember this time of having a pen and a pencil, uh, and no iPads and computers and iPhones and all of that. And we had one typewriter, electric typewriter, in our department, which we had to share. Um, and the Universitätsbibliothek was basically closed all August, so you couldn't get any books. So that means if you didn't have them, you had no access to data and no access to knowledge, uh, except if you bought your own books. Uh, and uh, the Universitätsbibliothek was also closed at weekends. It was only open on Saturday till lunchtime. So I think you remember these times hence. I remember them very well. And now I leap forward in a time when we can do research 24 hours a day from everywhere in the whole world uh, and access everything immediately. So for us now, no matter what discipline we are in, this digitalization and the open borders of science have met, meant absolutely salient qualitative differences in accessing knowledge and in communicating with colleagues. So uh, in that way, in my own lifetime, I've had the privilege to experience that and what it means for my own discipline. Now, I'm a sociolinguist. Uh, I work with language data in different languages. Uh, and sociolinguistics and communication studies doesn't mean competence only in languages, but it means looking at how meanings cross borders in specific social contexts. So for us, we have, I've been part of various big EU projects, and I want to tell you what this would mean for us now. We have collected, for example, focus group data in 10 different languages uh, about the way migrants could access employment and were telling us their stories uh, in, from Poland to Austria to Germany to Malta and Cyprus. It's a ve very big project, also Sweden was involved. And we could not really compare these data because we had to send these data uh, you know, on disks or somehow uh, put them on Dropbox, but it was very difficult to actually share these data. Then there is another issue, confidentiality and consensus of interviewees, uh, which I think relates to the fairness you've talked about, but is a specific problem we have not talked about yet. Uh, social sciences relies on the consensus of certain participants to share their views, their beliefs. We have open interviews, we have semi-standard, we have all these various methodologies, and we will have to make sure that the anonymity of our participants is there, yeah? because otherwise we would not be able to share anonymized data, but we also have to anonymize them and we have to probably translate them. 
Uh, I don't know if that has been thought about, but we will not only have to share results in many languages, which will mean a lot of money, not, because not everything makes sense in English, although we all speak English, but um, we also have to think of specific meanings and connotations which are transported in other languages which we cannot translate that easily. Uh, and uh, that is very important to understand behavior. Yeah? It's not just a hobby of linguists, it's much more, because otherwise we don't understand what makes people do things in specific ways, in specific contexts. So, we need to think about anonymity, we need to think about translation, and we need to think about visualization of data. Now, I have seen these wonderful visualizations, but we have also worked in a project about Europe's crisis, and I know there are many, you all know that, uh, and about Europe's memories and pasts. And we have started putting together an archive of iconic images uh, from Soviet tanks in Prague to uh, various incidents all over Europe which were, uh, which you don't forget. Yeah, they can be positive or negative memories. We would like to share this, but we need to comment those images. Yeah, you can't just share images, there has to be text, there has to be meta commentary. So these are all questions which we need to think about when we build archives. Uh, finally, I would like to say that we also want to share data which we collect in ethnography and in interaction studies. So linguistics and discourse analysis is not only related to analyzing newspapers, that's the easiest because you can download them, or big national corpora, which you have the BNC, the British National Corpus, and there are other corpora in many languages. In Germany, we have Mannheim. Uh, in Austria, we have something in the Austrian Academy. So these are accessible corpora, lexical corpora, but we want to share spoken data as well and behavior, gesture, habitus. Uh, I don't really know yet how we can do that, yeah? because we need to take videos and we need to again translate them. Yeah? So this is just something for the future uh, for all of us to deal with because this is interdisciplinary. There is no way around this. Uh, and finally, something where I think linguistics, and this is another field, we could help to make this accessible EOSC to the lay public. We need to, and there were several speakers who said, people don't know what this is. What is EOSC? What is FAIR? What is sharing? What is interdisciplinarity? Uh, why is this important? I think we need to write and uh, propagate this fantastic achievement for the lay public uh, in all languages in Europe, uh, and to really uh, disseminate in an understandable way so that the public understands why we need this, why this is such an enormous achievement. And what I'm most happy about is that in a Europe with, which is now thinking about constructing borders and walls all around the place, is finally having a science without borders. Thank you very much. Many thanks indeed. We have now come to a key moment in information exchange, which is the coffee break, which you will find just outside. You'll also find the portal booth. I've been asked, could you return here to start the session punctually at 12 o'clock, because whatever happens, it will be beginning at 12. Thank you very much. Enjoy your coffee.